Hi, Sunday School teachers and Bible study leaders. Welcome to our overview of LifeWay's Explore the Bible lesson of 1 Kings 8, 46 through 60 for June 12, 2022 with the title of Repentance. One way that you could begin this lesson would be to ask your group, what prayer that you have heard would be the most touching or the most memorable or uh, the best prayer that uh, you have ever heard? Does one come to mind? Uh, I bet several of you or several in your class could think of one. <laughs> one that just immediately came to my mind when I thought of this was the prayer that our son Paul prayed uh, as a little boy after he went to a birthday party at his grandma's house and he was saying his prayer before he went to bed that night and he prayed, God, Thank you for letting us smash bugs on Grandma's porch tonight. <laughs> I'll never forget that one. And uh, you, you, you have some prayers, or maybe your class has, has a prayer that uh, you heard that Im Im impressed you or impacted you, or one that was very memorable for you, for, for you. I think it might be a good way just to get your people talking and involved in your lesson for the day. But then you can say, today we are going to look at one of the great prayers in all history, which is the prayer of King Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 8. Of course, that's our lesson passage for today. Context here, Solomon had uh, just finished building the temple of the Lord, and at the beginning of verse 8, they, the priests bring the Ark of the Covenant into the temple, and when they bring it in, verses 10 and 11 uh, say that the, the cloud of the glory of Yahweh filled the temple, so the priests couldn't even stand to minister in it. And then in verse 22, Solomon begins to pray a prayer of dedication. Interestingly, just a little side point, but I think it's of note, verse 22, as he begins praying this prayer, says he stood before the altar. But if you read to the end, verse 54, it says, he arose from before the altar of Yahweh from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread towards heaven. So at some point in the prayer, Solomon evidently went from standing before the altar to kneeling before it. So I think that's, that's kind of interesting. He was really into the prayer, humbled himself in it, and then knelt before the Lord. But notice how Solomon begins his prayer in verse 23. And this is not the, the focus passage per se, but it's hard to kind of jump into the middle of it without uh, some context, looking at the beginning of the prayer. And significantly, he begins his prayer with praise. O oh, Yahweh, remember whenever you see Lord in the Old Testament in all four caps in Hebrew, that's the personal name of God, Yahweh or, or Jehovah. Uh, he says, oh, he prays, O oh, Yahweh, God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing loving kindness to your servants. So Solomon begins his prayer with praise. It's, it's a great example for us, just like Psalm 100 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Jesus taught us to begin our prayers with praise. Hallowed be thy name. Praising him is the great way to begin our prayers. And, and once he begins with praise, Solomon then makes a, a whole series of requests. And uh, our focus passage for today, beginning in verse, verse 46, has one of those requests. When they sin against you, and of course Solomon is speaking here about the people of Israel, but he makes an important theological point, one that we all need to be aware of because he adds, for there is no man who does not sin. Here we find that the doctrine of the depravity of man, all have sinned. And this is really the root of all of our problems, that we have all sinned. Sometimes we hear people say things like, how could somebody do that? Maybe of one of the recent shootings in our country or the war in Ukraine or immorality in a, a Christian leader or some other person. How, how could they do that? Well, the answer is sin. That, that's how they can do it. And that's how we could do it too, because we are all sinners. Romans 3.23 is very famous in that regard. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We saw a couple of weeks ago, God created us to be fulfilled by his glory. What is it that separates us from his glory? It's our sin. Sin is the root of all of our problems. We need to understand that. The word sin is not much in our society's vocabulary anymore, but it ought to be. Sin is rebellion against God. Sin is at the root of all of our problems personally, and sin is at the heart of all the problems that we face in society. It's not lack of education that's our problem. It's not lack of government, a laws that is our problem. It is sin. And Solomon makes it clear here. He says, for there is no man who does not sin. This is an important point. We have all sinned, and we continue to sin. Now note, in Solomon's prayer leading up to this point, he sometimes says, if. Uh, for example, in verse 37, he says, if there is pestilence in the land and, and so on. But notice here when he gets to verse 48, he says, when, 
when they sin against you. Not if, but when. It is going to happen. We are going to sin. Why? Because we're all sinners, both by nature and by choice. We inherited a sin nature from Adam, and we have all personally chosen to sin on our own as well. This is a fundamental doctrine. Each of us has to come to the realization that we are sinners. It's essential for salvation. You're not going to ask Jesus to save you till you realize you're a sinner. So this realization of sin and that we have all sinned is just basics, foundational in Christianity. Uh, as an application, people often ask, is my child ready to be saved? Is my grandchild ready to, to become a Christian? This doctrine helps us here. Do they realize that they have sinned? Uh, it's essential that they realize they've sinned uh, for them to be saved. Let me just give you an example from our own family. Our son David, uh, when he was very young, came forward at the invitation one time and said that he wanted to be saved. So I asked him, like I, I always ask, uh, David, do you know what sin is? And he said, yes. And I asked him, can you give me some examples of sins? And he, and he did. Then I said, David, have you sinned? And he goes, oh, no. <laughs> well, I knew from that, uh, that that he was not ready to be saved if he, he didn't realize that that he had sinned. Well, uh, a year or two later, David did come forward again, this time with tears in his eyes because he knew he'd sinned and he needed to ask Jesus to be his Savior. So this doctrine of sin is fundamental in the Christian life. We, we can't really be saved if we don't admit that we're sinners. Now, this may help some of your class members with their children or, or their grandchildren, or maybe even their own salvation, that there is no man who does not sin. It's just a fundamental doctrine. And even after our salvation, as God's people, we continue to sin. First John 1 John 1.8 says, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. That's present tense. If you say that right now, even as a Christian, you have no sin, you're deceiving yourself. We are sinful people. Uh, even as Christians, we're fighting our flesh, our old nature, and we continue to sin. Well, we can go a couple of ways with that truth. It is important that we all realize that we still sin. We need the humility of understanding that. We need to totally depend upon God every day to forgive us and help us because we continue to sin. And I think it can also give comfort to a Christian who is burdened with their sin to realize that all Christians still sin. But on the other hand, I see some people today taking this in a wrong direction. I'm increasingly hearing people today use this as an excuse for sin. They say, well, we all sin, or well, no one's perfect, as if that's an excuse to keep on sinning just because we all sin, as if it's no big deal. And as in everything in the Christian life, it's important to keep this in balance. Yes, we all sin, and yes, there is forgiveness in Christ, but that should never be used as an excuse to continue to sin or to treat sin lightly. Our sin is against a holy God, and we are accountable to him. So this doctrine of sin is a vital, vital doctrine and applies in our lives in so many ways. Well, in light of that, then, what, what happens when we sin? Well, we see in these next verses, in, in the first part of verse 46, it, it says what God does when we've sinned. Uh, Solomon says, when, when they sin, and you are angry with them and deliver them to an enemy, so they take them away captive to the land of the enemy. This describes the process of God's discipline. God's discipline of his people when they sin. Well, when God's people sin, he disciplines us for it. Here, here Solomon says, if they sin, God might deliver them to an enemy. You see numerous examples of that in scripture. In Judges especially, uh, they kept sinning. God kept allowing uh, other uh, nations to come in and, and, and conquer them. This happened most notably with Israel's captivity in Babylon. They, they continued to worship idols for, for generations after God had warned them. God finally allowed them to be taken in captivity to, to Babylon. But his discipline worked for their ultimate good. As history tells us, Israel never again worshipped idols after the Babylonian captivity. So God's discipline was working in his sinful people. And his discipline happens to us as individuals too. David gives us a great example of that. Psalm 32 is a great cross-reference here. He says in verse 3, When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away. He said, Day and night your hand was heavy upon me. God was disciplining David for his sin. In verse 5 says he finally acknowledged his sin to God and repented and, and, and was forgiven. You might want to read that passage in Psalm 32 in your class. It's a great story of God's discipline in his life when, when he sinned. But the testimony of Psalm 32 is a common one. We sin. 
God disciplines us and it brings us back to him. You may have an example of this from your own life or, or somebody you know, you might share that or ask your class. Do they know somebody, that, uh, either a personal experience or, or somebody they know in which uh, the, to whom that, that had happened? Prodigal son is a great, uh, another great scriptural example of this. There's a lot of prodigals uh, who get in the same situation as he did today. But the point is God disciplines his children who sin against him. Hebrews 12, 6 says, For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplined. And you, you might cross-reference again that whole passage, Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 10, that talks about God's discipline. One uh, real-life example from a friend of mine uh, when she was a young college student, she was commuting back and forth to college. One night on the way home, she got a ticket for speeding. I was there at their house uh, when uh, she was there, me and some of my friends, and, and she told her mom, she said, I don't know why he, the policeman stopped me. She said, a, a, a lot of people are going a whole lot faster. But her wise Christian mom said, but Terry, you are God's child, and he is not going to let you get away with it. Your group may have other stories like that. When God disciplines us, doesn't let us get away with something. Just like Hebrews says, those whom the Lord loves... He disciplines, and we see that here in 1 Kings 8, 846. So we sin, God disciplines us. What's our response going to be to God's discipline? Well, hopefully it will be repentance, and that repentance is the title of the, of the, the lesson for this time. And verses 47 and 48 here, really I think the, the key, the central passage here, describe for us repentance in God's people. Notice all the things Solomon itemizes in these verses. You could point these out or have, have your class members read these verses and call out what, what did they do in showing their repentance. And there's several things here. They take thought. They, they think about what they've done. They take thought in the land where they've been taken captive. They repent, literally turn, as we'll see in just a second. They make supplication to you, praying to God, saying we have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly. Notice he says three times, describes it in three ways. Sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly. Verse 48, if they return to you with all their heart and pray to you. All these actions describe someone who has, has sinned and who is now turning back to God. They think better of what they've done, admit their sin, repent, pray to God, return to him. It's a pretty good description of repentance. And repentance is another key doctrine in this text. The, the Hebrew word for repentance here is shub, S-H-U-B, means to return, to, to repent. It's used in this passage twice, both in verse 47 and verse 48. that uses the words repent and return in the New American Standard. But the, the word is it's the same word, shuv, repent, return. The word means to turn around, to return, to turn back. In Genesis 8 and 9, the, the Bible uses this word of the dove that flew out of the ark but didn't find any ground, so she turned back and returned to the ark. That, that dove turned around, turned back. That's what we do when we repent. We were going away from God. We repent and we come back to him. We, we change direction. The New Testament word uh, metanoeo uh, means literally a change of mind. But it's a change of mind that leads to a change in direction. I, I like that definition of repentance. A change of mind that leads to a change in direction. And that's what we see in the prodigal son, isn't it? it the Bible says in, in Luke, he, he came to his senses and said, I will get up and go to my father. He had a change of mind, came to his senses, and it led to a change in direction. He went back to his father. And that's what will happen when we repent too. It's a change of mind. I've been going the wrong way. This is wrong what I've been doing. And so then we change our direction. We stop going away from God and come back to obey him. We need to emphasize this, that the repentance is vital. We must repent, first of all, in order to be genuinely saved. And this is a neglected doctrine today. We don't hear much about repentance, but the Bible is full of verses on the necessity of repentance. Look it up in your concordance. So many. John the Baptist's message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus came, he came preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said in Luke 13, 13, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Paul in Acts 20, 21 says, listen, I didn't hold back. I shared the full gospel with you. What was that full gospel? Repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. It's repentance and faith. Repentance is vital. We've got to repent in order to be saved. There's a number of uh, illustrations of what repentance is. Uh, turning around, making a U-turn. 
I once uh, heard a story about a man who's driving down a main street in a small town and the street just ended and all of a sudden there was a sign that said, U-turn absolutely required. Well, that's true of becoming a Christian too. There is a U-turn, repentance, that is absolutely required for us to be saved. There's a main road through our town here in Angleton, Texas that's divided by a median. So if you're going south on the main street and want to get to, to Whataburger, you've actually got to drive past Whataburger, get, go to the next turnaround and make a U-turn. A U-turn is absolutely required to get to Whataburger. Uh, you, you can use one of those stories if you want to, or you may have an example like that in, in your own town. But make the point, the U-turn of repentance is absolutely required for salvation. It's not enough just to say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. As James says, the demons also believe, but they haven't repented. We've got to repent of our sins. We've got to acknowledge that we've sinned and be willing to turn from our sins to be saved. We need that message today because so many people say that they're followers of Jesus, but they haven't repented of their sins. And sure, we all sin. I mean, we just saw that but they're not making any effort to repent of their sins. They're, they're just content in them. They think, they think God's okay with their sins, and he's not. But we've got to repent of our sins in order to have genuine salvation and a real relationship with the Lord. This message is needed in our world today, and you can help by getting this message out to your class members this Sunday about repentance. And remember, it's not just all those people out there uh, who need to repent. We as God's people need to repent of our own sins. Try not to let your class time just deteriorate into a lament of all the sinful people out there and in, in the world. Make sure your, your members are thinking about their own sins too. What do we need to repent of? The Christian life is to be a life of continual repentance. And if we repent, the Bible says the good news is God will forgive us. Solomon prays this in his prayer. He says, Lord, if they repent and return to you, like verse 47 and 48 says, and then verse 49, hear their prayer. Verse 50, forgive your people who have sinned. But it's not just Solomon who asked the, 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 that God would hear and forgive. God himself said he would, didn't he? Second Chronicles 7 says in verse 11, after Solomon had finished the temple, God appeared to him in a dream, said in verse 12, I've heard your prayer. And he gives him that great promise in verse 14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and then turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. So God promises, if you will repent like that, and notice uh, the, the, the phrase, turn from their wicked ways, the word turn there is the Hebrew word shuv, the same uh, word as used here in 1 Kings eight forty seven. If you will repent, if you will re turn, God says he will hear, he will forgive, he will heal. That's a great promise, and God will keep his promise. In fact, one other great verse in this passage is verse 56, where Solomon says, not one word has failed of all his good promise. What a, what a great verse to study and memorize. Not one word has failed of all his good promise. And notice one other thing before we close this. This lesson ends near, near the end of verse 60. It says, so that, so that, notice that's what uh, that they call a purpose clause. Here's the purpose. Here's the reason for everything comes that comes before it. Why should God do all this? So that, and what is the so that? so that all the peoples of the earth may know that Yahweh is God. There is no one else. God does all that he does for us so that people will see and come to him. Reminds me of Psalm 67, one of my favorite psalms. It begins, God be gracious to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Why? That thy way may be known on the earth, thy salvation among all nations. Why does God give us the, the blessings, the answered prayers, all that he does for us? It's so that, so that, the world will see what he does with us and, and come to him. Israel lost sight of the fact that God wanted to use them to reach the nations. Let's not lose sight of it as God's New Testament people today. Let's ask him to help us be part of reaching out to the world for him. First Baptist Angleton uh, Church family, remember we got a mission team in Bulgaria this week. Let's pray for them, pray that God would use them, and let's all give and pray and go to the nations so that God may be known by them. 
Thank you for watching today. Remember, if you'll hit the subscribe button, you'll automatically get a notification when next uh, week's video comes up and you don't have to search for it. As always, if you write something in the comment section below, I'll specifically pray this Saturday and Sunday for you and for your group. And let me just uh, say a special thank you to all of you who have said that you're praying for me. Uh, that means a lot. Uh, some of y'all have even said you're praying for me daily. Uh, that's just so humbling for me. I, I just want to say thank you for the love and the grace that you're showing to me uh, by doing that. And I, I appreciate it so much. God bless you. See you next time, Lord willing.